If you're not inspired by the mission of Grace Church to teach the next generation, something is wrong with you, right? I mean, okay, wasn't that incredible? I mean, I just, ah, right? That's what it's all about, all about. In our last service, we had one of our students uh, be baptized. So it's just been a great morning of seeing uh, the privilege that we get as Grace Church to teach the next generation. Uh, Man, I don't take that for granted, and I invite God to be doing that for generations through this church. That is the point of what we do. Now, speaking of that, uh, I want you to kind of go way back for some of you and not so far back for others of you. I want you to remember the first time you ever saw a fairy tale. All right, now, some of you saw it on the wonderful world of Disney. Um, That's a way back. Some of you saw it on uh, little little tapes that were about this big. Others of you, maybe a DVD. Some of you read fairy tales, right? Uh, Think uh, Cinderella. Think uh, Seven Dwarfs. Well, they're pretty predictable, right? I mean, if you look at them as an adult, you look back, there's always tension. There's always some conflict. There's usually a bad guy, but then it resolves, and there's this incredible line, and they lived happily ever after, right? Now, when you read that, you knew that was the end of the story, but it was more than just that. That line has been around a really long time. In fact, uh, you can trace it all the way back to the 1700s in Italian literature, uh, a little bit closer, uh, grim fairy tales, and it's certainly been used ever since up to very modern times, including things like The Princess Bride and Shrek and WandaVision, all right? It's always talked about, this happily ever after. There's just something about that phrase because it's something we really, really want. You know, we want to know that once the crisis is over, that it's over. Uh, We want to know once we get through the conflict, it's resolved. We want to know that once we've made that commitment, that we can keep that commitment. We want to know that once God has taught us these lessons and shown us how to live, that we can actually do it. I mean, wouldn't it be great to live happily ever after. It'd be so great to be able to tie up our lives and our relationships and our spiritual journey with just one big nice bow. But that's just not the way it is, right? It's not the way it is. Today we're going to wrap up our walk through the book of Nehemiah, and you would think that what we get to today, which is the building dedication, uh, would be the end. It would be the nice bow. It would be the happily ever after. But what we're going to see is that the commitment of God's people is more like a roller coaster than the prince and the princess riding away on the chariot and saying, We're all going to live happily ever after. Now, I want to look back one more time. as This is the last week we're in Nehemiah. I hope you followed along because it's so important, all of it. But here's a reminder of what's happened up to this building dedication. First, Nehemiah had a burden. God gave him a burden, and it wasn't just to build walls in a city. It was to build, spiritually build the people of God. Then Nehemiah had a vision and a plan. He was this leader. He was gifted by God. And he had the ability to bring together all kinds of people with all kinds of agendas to get something accomplished. But then he hit a wall. He faced all kinds of opposition. And the opposition wasn't just from outside of the community. It was also inside the community. But they kept working through that. And Nehemiah then, he got to be a part of leading them to finish the physical building of the walls. And then, God wasn't finished building. Nehemiah got to lead the people into this spiritual building. Last week we walked through God doing such a profound work in the hearts of the people. But now, since the people have been dedicated, it's time for the building dedication. It's time to celebrate and dedicate what God has done. 
So we're all the way to Nehemiah 12, beginning in verse 31, and this is Nehemiah speaking. Here's what he says. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dung gate. Hoshiah and half the leaders of Judah followed them. And Ezra, the teacher of the law, led the procession. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the site of David's palace to the water gate on the east. Now, remember last week what happened at the water gate, right? That's where they made this this big commitment, this recommitment to the Lord. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall, together with half the people, past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, over the gate of Ephraim, the Jeshani gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate. At the gate of the guard, they stopped. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God, and so did I, together with half the officials, as well as the priest. And on that day... They offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. What an incredible sight to see. I hope that gives you a picture. Walking around the walls were these massive groups of people. They were all marching towards the temple. First Ezra, the the priest, leading one group with all kinds of instruments, including trumpets. And then Nehemiah leading the other group. It was this celebration uh, leading to them them to the temple to, to worship God. And it was joyful, and it was loud, and it was visible. We have some things to learn as we get ready for our own building dedication. The dedication was three things. The first of it was it was God focused. It was not about the people, it was about God. The focus was on God and on his faithfulness. And they knew without God, they would never have been back in the city and they would have never gotten the building to happen. The building was not theirs, it was God's. It was God-focused. It was a a celebration that God had been faithful even though the people had not been faithful. It was God-focused. God had protected them. God had led them. But it was also a trust reminder. These people had taken a big risk. Remember, they had enemies all around them, and they were obeying what God said to do. They had to work their their trust muscles as they had to work through all kinds of opposition. And as they walked on that wall, they were literally claiming what God had given them. It had to remind them of Abraham when Abraham walked the land and claimed the land. It had to remind them of Joshua when he walked the land and claimed the land. It was a trust reminder. But it was also this incredible public witness. See, they were loud on purpose. They wanted everyone to hear it. Nehemiah 12, 43, we read it. It says this. Look at it again. It says, the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. See, they wanted everyone to know that God had done it. Their enemies could hear it. The enemies that had tried to thwart the building were hearing the celebration. The enemies who had said, hey, not even a fox could walk on that wall, were seeing countless numbers of people walk on that wall in celebration. Amazing. Those walls would stand even with all those people, and they wanted to draw as much attention to the God who had made it happen. Now, I can't wait for our building dedication. In the next few weeks, we'll be getting the very last permissions and the last information that we need to be able to start our building. It is so soon. And then it's only going to be months that go by, and we'll be able to dedicate our building. 
So imagine our building dedication. I mean, we've got two choirs, right? We've got, we've got the classic choir led by Tom and Goman, and, and we've got the modern worship team leading. Imagine them walking all over that property, that beautiful property that the Lord has given us, all marching into the sanctuary to give praise to God and to celebrate. I mean, it will be God-focused, right? We'll remember all the ways that God has so faithfully led us. And it will be a trust reminder. We'll celebrate all the ways that God has led us, but the ways that we've had to, to trust him. And we'll be claiming that land together, remembering all the difficult moments we've had and the risks that we took. And it'll also be a, a public witness. Because the reason we have that building is so that we can shine the love of Jesus to the Lehigh Valley and we can invite everyone to be a part of it. We want everyone to know that's not our building, that's God's building. And God has been faithful. I can't wait. You know, everything they celebrated that day, their building dedication, Nehemiah's, everything that had gotten them to that day all was built on the foundation of one thing. I mean, the burden that Nehemiah felt, all the, the physical building, all the spiritual building inside the hearts of the people, it was all built on this covenant between God and his people. God had been faithful and the people had responded and they had committed themselves to the Lord. They were in covenant with the Lord. And the people through that covenant had made all kinds of promises. All kinds of promises that they wanted their lives that, that to be different, to flow out of that covenant that they had made. And that's what had brought them to this dedication. So it may surprise you that this is not the end of Nehemiah. Nehemiah does not end with this wonderful celebration. There's no neat bow. There's no happily ever after. And it really may surprise you that after all they had seen, all the ways that God had been faithful and had been walked with them, it only took one year and they broke every promise that they ever made. After the building is dedicated, Nehemiah goes back to his job as a cupbearer for the king. And one year later, <laughs> he comes back to see everything in shambles. Here's what it says in Nehemiah chapter 13, beginning in verse 6. While all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Some time later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done. Now, side note, if you don't know who Eliashib is, that's the priest that Nehemiah had set in charge of everything while he was gone. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them what belonged, the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. Now here what's, here's what's going on. He gets permission to come back to check on everything. And he can't believe what he sees. His first step is to... The, the, his first step when he gets back is to go to the temple, and Tobiah is living in the temple. Now, do you remember who Tobiah is? There was Sembalat. He was the big bully. He was the one who was always threatening the Jews and trying to keep them from building the walls. But Tobiah was his sidekick. He was actually the one who said, hey, not even a fox could walk on the walls of, of, uh, that you've built. He had joined Symbolic in ridiculing and trying to stop the Jews. But he didn't just ridicule the Jews. He ridiculed God, their God. And now, Tobiah is living inside of the temple walls. 
He had his own things, and he was, had them there in one of the rooms in the temple. Now, that may sound like a really small thing. I mean, it may sound like even a hospitable thing. But that little thing was symbolic of much bigger thing and bigger problems. And in this case, the little thing was extremely serious. Tobiah had been given given a place in the place. He'd been given in a place where God resided and where the people came to worship and be in God's presence. As Nehemiah went from the temple, he found more things that were wrong. He found more evidence of this covenant breaking that was going on. See, last week we talked about in Nehemiah 10 how at the water gate they had made a commitment to live differently. Out of this relationship that they had, they recommitted themselves. This, this great spiritual building happened, and, it, and there was this great climax in the book of Nehemiah where they said, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to live for you. But it was gone. Nehemiah found every one of their promises broken. First of all, they had promised to live separate. What that meant is they were to live a distinct life. They were supposed to follow the Torah and live so others would know about God's ways. And that included they weren't supposed to marry people who didn't believe. And they were supposed to dedicate their firstborns to the work of the Lord. Nehemiah looked around and he saw that They were breaking that promise. Second, they had promised to keep the Sabbath. And what that meant is this one day was supposed to be fully dedicated to God. So your business was supposed to be put aside for the Sabbath day. Well, Nehemiah looked around and he saw they'd broken that promise. Then they promised, they they promised that they would keep the work of the temple going, that they would support God's work. Nehemiah looked around, and he saw they had broken that promise. One year, all those promises broken. Now, before you point your finger and call them out, you should definitely look in the mirror. See, God is faithful, and God is pursuing, and God is inviting But you, you regularly choose to go a different way. You regularly do that. All of us do that. See, God is a covenant keeper and a maker, and we are covenant breakers. Now, some of you may go, yeah, you don't know half of it. I am definitely a covenant breaker. I want to be a good Christian, but I just can't do it. And if you say that to me, I'm going to tell you, you're exactly right. You can't do it on your own. Because all of us are in the same position. There's a hymn we sing in all the services called Come Thou Fount. And there's this great line in it. It says, we are prone to what? Wonder. We're prone to wander. We, we, we can't help ourselves. We are prone to leave the God we love. Paul, you know, super Christian Paul, right? I mean, if there's anybody who should have it right, it should be Paul, right? Well, he talks about this struggle, and he, he, he tells us what it's like in Romans 7. He says this. He says, I have the desire to do what is good. But I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I mean, that sounds awful, right? I mean, he, he, he can't change himself. But Paul also knows the answer. Here it is. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The only way you're not going to be a covenant breaker or the only way you're going to remake your covenant 
is through Jesus. That's why Jesus had to come. Because this cycle of God being faithful and the people not being faithful that carries on to today, the only way it was going to change was by God doing something. And without God taking the most radical and loving of all steps, it never would happen. Jesus came into the world. God sent Jesus to us to take our place. He took on our bad choices. He took on your broken promises. He took on the the big mistakes you've made and also kind of the things that you think are little misses. Everything that keeps you away from God, Jesus came to take away. See, he gave his life so that you could have your life. And what that means very practically today is that if you today have turned away from God, if you've broken covenant with God, God is ready. He is faithful. He always is. And his deepest desire is to rebuild you and to restore you. He wants you to come back to him to live your best life that you will never live without him. Now, so what about your happily ever after? I mean, only you know the roller coaster of your life. So today, let me just ask you really bluntly, are you living for God today? Or are you living for yourself? Who runs your life? Do you run it? Or is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is he running it? Are you living your commitment to Christ or are you breaking the promises you've made? Are you taking steps toward the Lord? Or are you taking steps away from the Lord? You know, this morning you, you might be able to look back and, and, and remember that God was at work in your life at one time. And he, he did things that you, you could barely believe. He called you to live your, your best life. But then somehow, some way, you forgot. You got too busy. You chose a, a different way. There are things in your life that you just let stay and fester that you know don't honor God. Well, however it happened, you broke the covenant. You broke your commitment to God. Now, if we were to sit down and you said, well, (laughs) hey, you know, I've got some little things in my life that, yeah, it's not that bad. I'm, I'm doing all right. Let me tell you, little things are oftentimes the things that start you on the path away from God. Way back in 1912, there was this, all this excitement about a 900-foot, over-the-top, luxurious ship. It's called the what? The Titanic, right? 2,000 passengers and crew set off on that first uh, voyage to New York. A first-class ticket cost 4300 bucks in 1912. I mean, that is a lot of money. On the boat was every kind of amenity you can imagine. I mean, there were swimming, uh, swimming pools, and, and there were uh, cigar rooms, and there was a spa, and there was all this incredible food. I mean, 75,000 pounds of meat, 16,000 bottles of wine. They were a little light on other amenities, like lifeboats, but they, but they had no clue that this would be anything but this incredible experience. Well, you know what happened. Four days into that voyage, tragedy struck, and the unsinkable Titanic that didn't even need lifeboats took the lives of over half of those passengers. Now, everybody thought that it was this huge hole in the, in, in the boat. It hit, it, it hit an iceberg, and there was this hole, and that's what had caused the Titanic to sink. But years later, scientists and, and, and divers used sound waves to, to, to probe the wreckage. They had to go down two and a half miles. 
And they were really surprised by what they found. There was not a huge hole in the boat. There were six very narrow slits on the hull of the ship. Six narrow slits. Folks, little things can sink ships. What might seem to be a small thing in your life can really set your path. It can set you towards God or it can set you away from God. In two weeks, we're going to start a new series called In Training. Now, of course, the Olympics are coming. We're going to be watching athletes, but we're going to be talking about our spiritual training. We're going to be talking about habits that are called spiritual disciplines. And you might think they are really small things. But i got to tell you, these things can grow you. These things can help you keep your promise to God and can help you live for him. God wants to grow you through these spiritual disciplines. Looking forward to that series. Hope you'll be there. Nehemiah saw all those broken promises. And if you read that whole chapter, you're going to see he did some pretty crazy things to make things right. But one of the things he did that he has done since the beginning of Nehemiah is he prayed. And as he prayed, he kept calling those people back to this covenant relationship that they had promised that they were going to be a part of. And that's what I want to do this morning. If you, today, if you know you've been walking the wrong way, I mean, COVID's been a hard year, folks. But there are other things that aren't COVID that are also really hard. If you've taken steps away from Jesus rather than towards Jesus, I want to tell you, you don't have to stay away from him. He wants you back. And all you have to do, remember, he's done everything you need. All you have to do is admit that you've blown it. You have to ask Jesus to, to be your leader and your forgiver because that's what he dreams for you. So let's pray together. Let's ask God to do some work in our life. Let's pray. God, we do pray that you are doing your work in the hearts of your people this morning, whether they're here in the room or whether they're watching online. Would you, as only you can do, would you convict us? Would you call us? Would you invite us to not settle for less, but to long for more with you? God, at some level, each one of us, every person hearing this message needs to bend our knee to you again because you deserve our life. And we so often keep it are parts of it from you. And because of that, we miss out on your best for us. But Lord Jesus, I know that there are also people listening today who heard your word and through the Spirit now know that you want them back. So I pray for anyone who has broken commitments and promises. I pray for anyone who has put you anywhere but first place in their life. God, today is the moment. You came, you sent Jesus in the world so you could be the bridge. You could bring us back. You died so that you could do it. So in this quiet moment, hear the hearts of those who need to come back. Thank you for being a covenant maker and a covenant keeper even when we are covenant breakers. And thank you today for receiving those who've lost their way, receiving them with open arms. You're ready. God, do your work in us. We've seen it and we want to see it again. Jesus' name and for his sake.